Welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining us for day two of Virtual Astronomy Days. We're so happy to have you here with us this afternoon. My name is Martha Fisk, and I'm an educator here at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. We are going to be learning about the fun of high-powered rocketry from a group of North Carolina State University students, and I will be letting them introduce themselves in just a moment. But we are going to be in our program today in two spaces. So we will be in Zoom and we will also be on YouTube. And so you can interact with us in either of the two places wherever you have happened to show up for this and we'll make sure that we get your questions and your comments. And so before I officially hand off the program, I am gonna do our quick Zoom tutorial with our reminders. And we do want to thank our sponsors for the programs this week, and it's North Carolina Space Grant and Pepsi. So we thank them for supporting all of the programs that you're getting to experience this week. So when we are in Zoom, you can have closed captions available. So this is the next few slides are gonna just show you how to do that and remind you about that. And you will be able to see the subtitles that way. And we're also going to be dropping a link into the YouTube chat for you to see the Typewell link for that as well in YouTube. And then for the best viewing, you should click speaker view and side by side mode so you can see who is talking and what they are sharing with you. And then also our friendly reminder to please be a good digital citizen. So we'd love to have your comments and questions, but please remember to be respectful and kind and stay on topic. So with that, I am going to end my screen and I am going to pass it off to our North Carolina State University Rocketry Club. And I was supposed to ask you while we were waiting and you can still be typing this into the chat while we're getting started, but if you could build a rocket, what would you name it? I was supposed to ask you that earlier. <laughs> so. I think I would name, I was trying to think of this earlier, I think that I would name my rocket after my area code that I grew up in, in Miami. So it would be Rocket 305. <laughs> and if you, if you think of that and add that on later, we can all enjoy that. We have um, Hedgy, Firebolt, <laughs> those are some of our suggestions from the chat. Roberto, that's a good one. And then you have to dance because of that. Okay, Rexon says his favorite animal is a hedgehog. That'd be a good name. Okay. All right, so you can keep adding your comments in and I will let I will let our guest speakers get started. Take it away. Thanks, Martha. And so as she said, uh, we are the High Powered Rocketry Club at North Carolina State University. And so to kind of get started, uh, we're gonna go ahead and introduce ourselves. So my name is Mike, and I am right now a junior in aerospace engineering with the club. And my job with the club is to organize outreach events where we do events like this and go out and talk to people about what we do and why we like studying rocketry. And this will be my third year with the club. And so if everyone else wants to go ahead and introduce themselves, go ahead. Um, hi, I'm Caitlin. I'm a freshman at NC State and I am studying aerospace engineering. Um, it is my first year in the club and I've loved it so far. Sorry, had a little technical difficulty there. Can you all hear me? All right. I'm Francis. I am also an aerospace engineering student. I am a junior. Um, this is my fourth year with the club. Very exciting. I'm going on to do senior design next year with Mike. I'm Sophia. This is my first year in the club because I'm a freshman and I'm studying material engineering. It's been a lot of fun so far. And my name is Frank. I'm a junior in aerospace engineering, uh, but this is my first year as well with the Rocket Club. And uh, yeah, I just love rockets. <laughs> so. And with that, kind of who we are as a club is really what we are is we are a collection of students and we all have one thing in common. And that thing is we all really like rockets. And so we come from all different majors 
and we like to be able to build high powered rockets and compete in the NASA student launch competition. And so for that, every year, NASA gives us a big old rule book full of rules and we go through and build both a rocket and a payload that flies on that rocket in order to accomplish a certain task. And so NASA will tell us basically build a rocket that will meet these parameters and fly to a certain altitude and then upon landing deploy a payload that can accomplish a mission. And a kind of example of that payload is in the past year we have made landers and drones and rovers and all of these things are really meant to simulate real life missions that NASA is currently working on. And with that, one of our other club members are going to talk about kind of some of our rocket launches and how they went. Yeah, so we've got a few videos for you. The first one is a slow motion video of one of our rockets launching. So just in a second, you'll see it launch. There it goes. And so you can see from the picture on the left, like how it launches, it's attached to a, a rail and then the, it ignites and it goes hopefully straight up. Um, another cool thing about this rocket in particular is if you notice the flame that's coming out of the bottom, it's not the stereotypical red and yellow flame that you would normally see. It's blue. And this is just because of the fuel and the type of motor that we use for our rockets. Okay, and then this next video, it's a video of one of our full-scale rockets launching. And what full-scale means is it's a rocket that is as big as we're going to build it. Like this would be the size of a rocket that we would launch at a competition. Uh, so you can notice that the flame is not blue, it's pink. It, this is actually the same fuel as the other rocket. Um, it's just got a different motor. And you can really see from this video like how fast it launches and it disappears into the sky pretty quickly. And sometimes we can't see where it is until the parachute's open. How far do we have to be away from when it launches? Pretty far. Uh, we're usually like across a creek from where it launches. All right, so this next video I think is really cool. So it's actually taken by a camera that's attached to the rocket itself. So you'll actually be, be able to see like what the rocket looks, what it looks like to be a rocket. Um, so you can see how, how fast it spins when it's in the air. And like right now it's starting to tip over and start spinning again. And so this just means that it's like reached as high as it's gonna go. And now it's like gonna start, like the parachutes are gonna open and it's gonna start its descent. You can also really tell like it takes a lot longer for it to hit the ground than it takes for it to get up in the air. And this is just so the rocket doesn't damage itself. And we did get a question that was answered in chat, but um, R asked how high does the rocket get? And the answer was that we're, it's typically a few hundred feet away from the launch itself. So the uh, actually the the height of the rocket depends on whether we launch on the smaller ones or one of the bigger ones, and also how big of a motor we use. Um, our typical launches go up between three and five thousand feet, um, depending on the size. Um, the the few hundred feet is how far we stand away when it's launching, just to make sure that we're safe. But these rockets go almost a mile high, and they can go higher uh, depending on uh, just how big of a motor you put in. Yeah, and so for the competition, NASA says we need to be between 3,000 and 6,000 feet. But I know people who fly their own rockets and can go up to like closer to 10,000 feet, but we don't have any club rockets that are capable of doing that. And I think this year's rocket is supposed to go close to 4,000 feet. Yes, and there's another question. How do you control where it's going to land? Uh, we, we don't really control where it's going to land. Um, it sort of like depends on the wind that day. Uh, and we hope that it doesn't land on us. Yeah, so, so yeah, we use parachutes, which we'll talk about later, to make it fall slowly to the ground. But yeah, we, we really can't control it. In fact, one of our launches last semester 
um, someone else's rocket that, that that they launched, it landed in between our cars and almost on our tent. Yeah, uh, we so were all running out of the way to avoid it. The, the funny story with that one is I was sitting on the tailgate of someone's car when that happened, and the back part of the rocket starts coming straight at me, and I had to jump into their trunk in order to not get hit by the end of a rocket. And so most of the time that doesn't happen, but really we're at the mercy of wherever the wind wants to blow the rocket. Yeah, and we have one more video of a launch. And so this is another camera that's attached to the rocket, but it's it's pointed towards the, the bottom of the rocket. So you can see the ground right there and it's about to launch. Um, in this video, you'll actually be able to see the parachutes and you'll be able to see like the rocket like start to pop open. So there it goes. Um, you can see how much smoke comes out of the rocket, but you also like, see like like the smoke stops pretty, pretty suddenly. And our rockets, they only launch, like they, they only ignite for about like five or six seconds. And then the rest of it's just like inertia, just keeps on going up until it hits a certain height. And then you can see the parachutes have deployed. Um, and then... You'll see like there's two parachutes. One of those would be a drogue parachute. So it's like a, a much smaller parachute to sort of just like keep the balance of the rocket. And then the other one is like the main parachute. It's much bigger. And that's the one that you see for most of the time. Um, all that string is called a shock cord. And that's like what connects the parachute to the main body of the rocket. And that just keeps like, it's a very like special type of rope. And it just keeps like the parachute from like breaking off of the rocket. Yeah, so now that rocket's just slowly falling back down, and everyone on the ground right now is looking up at it to make sure that it doesn't land on them, <laughs> and, like, and they are getting out of the way in just in case it is. But um, typically, those parachutes deploy at about five, 600 feet, and there you go. Now it's on the ground, and hopefully it's nearby, so that way we don't have to walk too far to pick it up. Yeah, and you can also notice like the rockets, even though it's on the ground, it's still moving. And that's because like the parachute is still getting a lot of wind and the parachute like drags the rocket on the ground. So we have to like approach it kind of carefully. All right, so all we've showed you guys so far is the successful launches, which is how most of them go. But there are definitely a few exceptions to that rule. So here on our next slide is a catastrophe at takeoff, which is one of the reasons we have to stand so far away from the rocket because we use black powder um, and the motor and we don't know what's going to happen. Like in this one, it exploded. So you can see this is all of the same rocket in different progressions throughout the way. And the reason it exploded, we had to figure it out afterwards, was the motor casing had a sidewall blown out. So then it tore up part the rocket because the fumes weren't going in the right place. So instead of going out of the bottom of the rocket, it was going out the side and that made the motor fall out. So little fun fact, if you look in the picture on the far right, something in the bottom corner where the mouse is going around, that is actually the motor falling back to the ground before it was even up to a decent height and out of sight. So um, that is one of the catastrophes at takeoff. And here is one of them being recovered. So this rocket, once again, all of the pictures are from the same rocket, same day, and um, the parachute didn't come out. So what happened was that it lo um, lodged itself deep into the ground. That is probably two or three feet sticking out of the rocket and two or three feet are still under the ground. We had to get it pulled out very strategically. But um, then of course, later we have was like, what went wrong? What can we do better next time? So if you look at this little eye shaped screw, it came out of the bolt where it was supposed to go. So that's one of the things that we could prevent in testing that we do before, but that will be talked about later. So um, take it away, Frank. Yeah, so, so before I get to testing, uh, there's a question in the chat. How many acres is the area where you launch? I don't know how many acres, but we go out uh, towards the coast, actually over towards uh, Cherry Point, 
uh, if you know where that is. Um, and there's a lot of uh, there are big cornfields, basically, and and that's where we launch. Some of the farmers out there let us use their land, and uh, it gives us a perfect area. Uh, we know that planes won't be over there because it's a restricted airspace because of the military, and we just have big open areas. Um, yeah, and so fun fact about the cornfield, though, is most of it's a flat field. But then along it, there are some places where there are ditches with water in them so that the farmer can water the crops and have the field irrigated. And somehow, even though 99% of the field is not water, we always manage to find a way to land a rocket in the water. Yep, and that, that just results in a big mess we had to clean up every time. But uh, so, yeah, now you've seen a few videos of successful launches and some pictures of things going wrong. And so one of the most important things in our club and, and in this hobby is safety. And so the way that we try to make sure that the rockets are safe is we test. We do tests on everything. So this next slide is going to show a very, very complex piece of machinery called the Universal Testing Machine because that's as good of a name as the engineers that made it could come up with. And what this thing does is it just pulls. <laughs> so you hook up the whatever you're trying to test to both ends. Uh, if you look at that picture on the left, you can see the clamps. And all it does is it tries to pull the thing apart, sees how much force it takes to break it. And so this lets us find out, you know, how strong is our design? Do we need, is the, are the four bolts that we chose to use enough? Or is that not going to be strong enough to hold the rocket together? Do we need to use eight? You know, those, those sort of questions, you can do the math and, and try to design it appropriately. But really the best way to make sure is to actually test something to failure. So that's one of the ways that we try to make sure that we have a good design. Another way is to test the parachutes. So this video is actually of some of our club members. Uh, one of them had a pilot's license. So they rented a helicopter, went to their farm, and dropped a parachute out of the helicopter with a brick under it. And so there you see the parachute falling, and unfortunately, it goes right into the trees. So the parachute worked correctly, but then they had to chop the tree down to get the parachute back because those things are kind of expensive and we wanted it back. So yeah, we test the parachutes. And then the last thing that we test is the ejection for the parachutes. So this video right here shows the rocket separating and pulling the parachute out. And you see how quick that is. Um, we use a black powder charge to separate the rocket halves and pull the parachute out while this is while it's in flight. And we want to make sure that that happens because if it doesn't, it's coming down like a missile. Um, so we got to make sure that it separates. And one of the tests we do is making sure that the rocket will, that we have enough black powder charge to force that ejection and also that the rocket won't stick together. And we have another question. Um, the rocket bodies. Yes. Yeah, so we make, uh, the rocket bodies and the fins and the, the nose cones, everything in-house. Um, and some parts we do 3D print. In fact, this year we've 3D printed uh, camera mounts. We've 3D printed uh, rings to help with uh, putting the rocket together. And we're actually exploring more 3D printed stuff um, as we go. It's, it's one of the capabilities that we have that we're starting to use more and more. But the rocket itself, we make just about everything on that and put it all together. And I think Francis is going to take us into the design of the rocket. Yeah, so of course we have a competition that we need to design for. So there are a lot of design considerations. We have to declare an apogee, which is the highest point that our rocket reaches. So things that affect that are the weight. You have a limited amount of thrust that your uh, motor provides, but a varying amount of weight that you can put on that motor. And the more weight, the harder it is for the motor to push on the weight um, and the lower altitude that you end up reaching. We also have to consider the material. Uh, what conditions are we potentially encountering? Like, as I think Mike was saying, we have to worry about these giant irrigation dishes. Might we want to use waterproof material? Uh, strength also factors into it. We've got a lot of different material types and um, they all have different strength ratings for different types of activities. Um, 
yeah, we also have to consider stability. And so I think we can go to the next slide. Now structures, this uh, we call our structure system. Is there a penalty for exceeding the designated altitude, the designed altitude? Um, there, there is not. Um, if we get above, I think a mile, um, if we get way, way above, then um, NASA will probably catch that that's going to happen before we ever encounter that problem. But um, there is not a penalty as long as it is safe. We often exceed or underperform, um, and NASA NASA knows about that. Um, so in considering the structure of our rocket, um, we have to do, as I was saying, different parts of the rocket have different material properties. You can see in the bottom right, that is a um, structural analysis that's called finite element analysis in something called ANSYS. Um, and ANSYS just takes your little designed piece, cuts it up into a bunch of different bunch of little um, sub pieces and evaluates little mathematical quantities. And in this case, it's stress and it's strain. Um, that's called a bulkhead. A bulkhead is any material that, sep that fully separates one section of the rocket from the other. So that circular bit goes inside of the rocket and you can attach things to bulkheads. Um, yeah, and we then go on to assemble the rocket. Um, as you can see in this video, these circular things that this laser cutter is about to cut out are sections of bulkheads. We take these little sections that are laser cut and we epoxy them one by one. Epoxy is a basically a really strong glue that takes a long time to dry. We epoxy them together. And when we do that, we create a composite material that's really, really, really strong. Uh, we want it to be strong because if you tug on a bulkhead, uh, you don't want it to break because that can just fundamentally break your whole rocket. And as you can see in the pictures on the right, we have what are called layups, which is just when you sit, when you um, put epoxy on something and then you let it sit. Um, fin layups are on the bottom right, and I believe those are bulkhead layups. No, those are not bulkhead layups on the top left. Um, yeah, I think so there's a couple the of sections. The top one, I believe, is just couplers being glued in the body tubes. Yeah. Um, and we often use epoxy, like I said, to adhere one thing to another. We also use it to fill it different surfaces. If we have sharp corners, we just pop a layer of epoxy that has a filler material in it that kind of creates a smooth edge so it's more aerodynamic. And I believe we talk about aerodynamics next. Yes, aerodynamics. We want to make that rocket very, very streamlined um, so that we have less drag. If you stick your hand out of a car window and um, you hold it like this and the air is going over your hand like this, that is what we call streamline. That's a streamlined body. But if you hold it like this, it creates a lot of drag and the drag is going to contribute to your hand getting ugh, pushed back. Same thing applies for the rocket. The more bluff our body is, our rocket is, the more drag force it's going to have. Um, and things that influence the drag force are the size and the shape of the nose cone, uh, the size and the shape. Has anyone got a question in the chat? Has anyone ever gotten hurt in the club? I'm the perfect person to ask this question to because I'm the safety officer. Um, nobody's ever gotten seriously hurt, but we do keep a record of small cuts, bruises, just lab mishaps. We have had actually a common issue that we've caught with our little lab um, injury sheet. So hopefully no more cut hands on 3D printed parts. Um, but yeah, to answer your question, not seriously, just little minor cuts and scrapes. Um, our fin size and shape contributes to aerodynamics and fins actually help our rocket stay stable. Stability is something that's really, really important. If you have a rocket going up and it's all wibbly wobbly, it's going to go everywhere and it might come crashing back down. 
you also can sometimes have overstable rockets, which is the exact opposite. It, it, it's very strange. Um, your rocket, when there's a gust of wind, instead of in an understable condition, flipping out, it'll turn towards the wind. Um, question in the chat, the faster the better, or is there a limit in speed that you don't want to pass? Yes, and that limit is approximately Mach 0.8. Um, and Mach is a measure of the speed of sound. So 0.8 times the speed of sound is when you enter the transonic region. Um, so that is almost supersonic. That creates a lot of drag and it's just kind of nasty. And another question, is the altitude measured by an onboard instrument or a ground-based instrument? Great question. It is measured by um, two altimeters. So they're redundant altimeters um, that are housed on the rocket. They're barometric altimeters, just little computers that sit in our avionics bay near, but not with the black powder, glorified gunpowder that separates our, our rockets. Um, and the altimeter data is used for um, for both tracking the rocket, seeing how high it is, and um, blowing those black powder charges to activate the recovery system. And I think recovery is what I talk about next. Yeah, and one more thing I will say, though, about the limit on speed is that that's actually a NASA rule that our rockets for the competition are not allowed to break the speed of sound. And our club is actually responsible for that limit because one year we put a really big motor in a rocket and it was going supersonic by the time it left the launch pad. And so NASA was kind of like, yeah, let's not do that anymore. And so now there's a limit on the size of motor we're allowed to use. Darn. Okay, uh, next I'm talking about nose cone and fin design. So the nose cone is a little piece that sits on top of our rocket. It is our, it is part of our rocket, um, but it's just housed at the very tip. And again, it helps with reducing drag and different nose cone shapes are great for different speeds. Um, Von Karman, I want to say is good for supersonic. I know conical is good for supersonic. Um, we usually use um, either ogive or elliptical for our speed ranges. And um, yeah, there's just a variety of different types of nose cones for a variety of different speeds that your rocket might want to go to. Different fin designs also influence your stability, the amount of drag generated and reduced. Um, we use a clipped delta, I believe. And depending on the year we use either three fins or four fins. This year we're using four fins because we want to have uh, symmetry, a line of symmetry for really good camera imaging because that's that's our challenge, that's our competition this year. Um, yeah, that is nose cone fin design. Then finally, recovery and parachutes. I really love our recovery systems. I think they're just neat. Our rocket blows apart into different sections. You can see that line that's connecting those little black dots in the left picture. That line is shock cord. I think we talked about that a little bit. Um, it connects all the sections after the recovery charges have been blown. And there's a question in the chat. Why would it be better to have a curved end to the rocket if you're trying to cut through the air? Wouldn't something sharp like the cone design always be better? That is an excellent question. Um, I am not certain on this, but I believe, like, don't take my word for it, do your research, but I believe that is because um, of boundary layer effects, and a boundary layer is a part of a flow where when it comes in contact with the body, this is real high level stuff, or I guess, I guess low level, it's it's technical stuff. When a, when a flow comes in contact with a body, even if that flow is going super duper 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 fast, there is a portion of the flow that is a zero velocity and that depending on the velocity of the flow over the body that boundary layer can look really different um and supersonic flows are very strange because they always create when you bring a supersonic flow to a stationary object or relatively speaking 
Um, you create shock waves. Um, and the shape of the, the nose cone it, in the case of where there are shock waves is incredibly important. So I hope that answered the question. If you have any follow-ups, pop them in the chat. Um, as you can see on the right picture, we have our recovery lead from a, a few years ago folding the shock cord. We have to do this so that it um, sits nicely in the rocket and comes out without being tangled. Um, we use two, I think it's been talked about, two um, parachutes. The drogue is to slow everything down so that the main parachute doesn't tug unnecessarily on um, on the rest of the rocket body, because if it did that, there would be a big chance that the rocket would kind of maybe sort of just break, and that would be terrible. Um, yeah. I think that is recovery. Yeah. So like I was saying earlier, or actually first, before I get to this, uh, we have another question in the chat. Uh, how many times can we reuse a rocket and what are the main pieces you have to check before relaunching them? So I believe we reuse them usually three to five times before we start getting really concerned about um, the strength of the structure and stuff. And, we check everything on the rocket. In fact, in between launches, we'll do all of our tests again. We'll do another parachute test. We'll do an ejection test. We'll inspect the bulkheads and all the connections to make sure that nothing started to break on the last launch. So we'll, we'll inspect the whole thing, go through the entire checklist again before launch, and make sure that the rocket's still good to fly. Um, but yeah, so now, uh, so earlier though, I talked about safety being our number one concern, right? Our second biggest concern is how cool the rocket looks, because that's what really matters, right? So here's a few of our designs uh, from over the years. On the left there, you'll probably recognize uh, everybody's favorite uh, fried chicken restaurant around here, Bojangles. Um, on the bottom there, it's just a generic NC State one. Uh, the second from the right is this year's rocket. That was actually just done by one of our team members over the winter break. Uh, not pictured here is a rocket that we dedicated to our local cookout that got an 81.5 for their health rating. And so that's the name of the rocket, 81.5. So we, we try to have fun with it and just as a club decide what it should look like and and what we want to name it. You can really name it everything or anything you want. So these are just some of ours. Um Go go to the next slide, Mike. Yeah, and so real quick before I move on, someone in the chat asked, what do shockwaves do? And the simplest answer is that as the rocket's flying through the air, you have air that's moving really fast towards the rocket. And when it hits the rocket, it essentially comes to a stop in a very short period of time. And so all those air molecules start running into each other and you just get a buildup of air around the front of the rocket. And what that does is it essentially causes a lot more drag on the rocket, so it slows it down a lot. And really, when you do that, the aerodynamics start getting more complicated. But the main thing is, is it all the air just starts piling up, and so you get a really big change in pressure in front of the rocket. Yeah, boundary layer theory and aerodynamics and stuff is something that is still trying to be understood, especially the faster you go. Yeah. We have a pretty good understanding up to about Mach 5, I believe, so about five times the speed of sound. We really understand below the speed of sound, so your commercial jetliners and stuff like that. But when you start getting to Mach 10, Mach 15, uh, the first issue is it's really hard to do experiments with that. It's hard to get air moving that fast so we can study it. And also just weird stuff happens. Um, so you can actually make a lot of money if you can figure that out, I'm sure. So, um, but as for stuff that you guys can do, uh, here's a couple activities. So the first one we have there are, are straw rockets. So if you follow that link, it'll take you to a, a thing you can print out and you'll, you'll be able to cut out a rocket tube some fins and then you'll be able to design your own nose cone and you can launch that in fact if you look at uh martha if you can see her right now she's holding up one of her own straw rockets oh yeah martha why don't you say something show that off 
Yeah, these are a lot of fun to make. And based on what we've learned from you all today, we could you could totally change your fin and the and the, and the nose cone to see what it does differently, which is kind of fun. <laughs> Yeah, so so a lot of those are the same principles for the rockets we use. Uh, so that's just a nice activity that you guys can do uh, at home with just some paper and some tape uh, and, and have some fun and do some experiments. The next item there is a bottle rocket. And again, you would be surprised how close a water bottle rocket is to the real thing. In fact, for one of our classes, we had to do a whole project on designing and flying a water bottle rocket. That's our main grade for that class. The, the scientific principles behind it are basically the same as what SpaceX uses to launch stuff up into space. So that's another activity that you guys can do at your home safely uh, while still being able to take part in actual rocket stuff. And yeah, I see a few people in chat that like to make paper rockets. Yeah, I mean, any rocket is cool. <laughs> any rocket is cool. Um, but with that, I think we're going to open it up to any more questions that you guys have. Hey, thank you. And I, you've answered most of the questions as they've popped up in chat. We did have, um, let's see, one question. If from YouTube, it was if anyone is a member of the local Tripoli Rocketry Association. Yeah, so yeah. I know I am a member of the Tripoli Rocketry Association. And so for those of you who don't know, in the US at least, there are two big rocketry associations, which are basically like giant clubs that regulate hobby rocketry. And so there's the National Association of Rocketry, which is sometimes called NAR, and then there's the Tripoli Rocketry Association. And so to be able to fly the size rockets that we do, you actually need certifications. And there's three different levels of those certifications. The ones to be able to fly our full-scale rocket is a level two certification. And I know me and several of our other club members actually have our own level one certifications so we can go and fly our own high-powered rockets on a motor up to what's called an i impulse class i think we have a we have another question chat as well on who can join our club and what skills and knowledge you need and that's one thing that we we really try to make clear at nc state is anybody can join our club you do not need to be in engineering um you don't need to know how to design a rocket you don't need to know how to write a computer program uh, you, you can be any major you can be a history major and have no idea and we'll get you involved we'll, we'll get you something that you can do and we'll teach you about our hobby uh, our goal is to just get anybody and everybody involved uh, the more people that enjoy rockets and enjoy what we do you know the better um and then I'm going to let either Mike or Francis probably take this next one. What's your favorite rocket you've built? Because I've only built one with you guys so far. So, Yeah, so my favorite rocket we've built with the club is probably a rocket we call Dream Crusher, which I can see there might be a photo of it. Nope, we didn't include one. But it's called Dream Crusher, and it was the rocket we built my freshman year. And so... That's kind of the reason I have a special tie to it is because that was the first really big rocket that I helped build. And so it's also aptly named as Dream Crusher because we finished building it in the spring of 2020. And so right as we had finished building it, the university closed and we all got sent home because of COVID. And so we never actually got to launch that rocket. And so we still have it there in the lab. And it's one of my favorites, both because of how we built it and being the first one. And I also think it has one of the nicest paint designs we have on a rocket. Yeah, Dream Crusher was designed and named before the pandemic. <laughs> So it lived up to its name. We had no idea that it was going to turn out the way that it did. Um, but yeah, Dream Crusher is great. It was, it was in fact launched, but it was launched before we put the paint on it. Um, so it was never launched in its full glory. 
Um, and my favorite rocket that I have built um, with a club has probably been a rocket called Nice. And you can see Nice right there on that slide on the right. Um, I just think Nice is so pretty. And I got to lead the relaunch of Nice. It was a competition subscale, but then I believe either a semester or a year later, um, we relaunched it and I was heading up that team. So it has a special place in my heart. Um, and then We've got um, another few questions. How has this club improved your life? Something that you've learned being part of this club? Um, and I'll let you guys take that one. Yeah, so I can say for me, how has this club improved my life? It's honestly just kind of fun to hang out and build rockets with cool people. And so it's just an experience I'm really glad that I get to have in just me yeah, able to show off on any given day, you know, walk into the lab and work on rockets. But kind of in terms of classes, we do a lot of things in our classes where our professors will sit there and they'll go on about the theory and the equations for entire lectures about this, but we never really, you know, do a lot of construction or hands-on. And so it's a really great way to be able to take all these things we're talking about in classes and go do them. So like, for example, when we were mentioning in shockwaves earlier, that was actually the beginning of the lecture on what Francis and I learned in our aerodynamics class today. And so you get to see all these things we're learning in class show up in the things we're doing in hands-on projects. I think the next question there too is uh, how long are your rockets? So again, we have two sizes. We have subscales and full scales. Uh, the subscales are about four to five feet, typically not too big. You know, one person can carry them pretty easily. Uh, the full scales though, those can get to about eight or nine feet tall uh, and they're pretty heavy. In fact, that, that picture in the middle there is a full scale and it takes two people to carry. Um, they're, they're pretty big, so. Uh, got one more question uh, for all of us, actually. So I guess I'll go first. Uh, when and how did you discover your passion about building rockets? Uh, for me personally, I, I grew up down in Tampa, Florida. And I remember when I was probably eight or nine, so, so 18 years ago now, I went to Kenny Space Center with my father and I saw the uh, big, uh, Saturn, it's called Saturn V rocket. It was launched in the 60s and 70s. And me as a little kid, just looking up at that, I, I fell in love right away and, and knew that that's what I wanted to do. So that's that's how I got involved. Um. Yeah, so I know for me, I think I built my first low power model rocket in sixth grade as a part of an elective class. Uh, the fun story is it's actually still hanging up on my wall over there is that little green one on the bottom. And so ever since then i just really enjoyed building the rockets and i had built several of those smaller ones and so even from like high school i knew i wanted to kind of go into aerospace engineering and now that i'm in part of the club i've really gotten into just building bigger and bigger rockets because it's just something i love to do And I, I can also, you know, finish out if I or save something. Um, I would say I discovered a passion for that. I grew up around Houston, Texas, where Johnson Space Center is. And so I have a close connection with um, NASA to my childhood. And um, I, when I came to college, I saw on like the club website, that uh, rocketry was a thing in NC State. I'm like, that is what I'm gonna do. And immediately I was just like latching onto it and it was so good. Um, and really this club helped me realize a passion for at least high powered rocketry. Um, for me personally, I guess it's a little different than the other three so far. Um, I didn't find a passion for engineering or rockets until high school. I had a 
physics teacher actually in 11th grade. And that's when I first started thinking, wow, this is actually pretty cool how things work in real life. And you have explanations of that. And then um, we did a unit on gravitational pull and things in space. And I thought that was the coolest thing ever. So then my dad took me down to um, the Kennedy Space Center in Florida and looked around and saw those rockets. And from there on, I knew that's what I wanted to do. Got a couple more questions here. Um, someone asked me, uh, can, can we make a rocket that can go to space? And no, what we do here with these rockets cannot go to space. Um, we actually have another club at NC State that is trying to be the first college team to send a rocket to space. Um, they're making one. Uh, they're trying to make one. It's, it's going to be about 30, 40 feet tall and go up about 120,000 uh, kilometers. Uh, but that's not something we can do. What we do, max is about 5,000. Um, Trisha, uh, no, we don't have footage from when the rocket uh, exploded from the inside, at least, but I'm sure uh, somebody does out there. Yeah, um, so on that one, I think that is part of actually what our secondary payload is trying to get this year is we're trying to find a way to have a camera looking in where the parachute is so we can actually see what's happening as that parachute is being deployed. Uh, another question there, what is the age limit for the club? We don't have an age limit, um, but you do have to just be a student at NC State. And so if you're 12 and at NC State, cool, come join us. But uh, I will say uh, if you're doing rocketry on your own, like kind of hitting your certifications, you do have to be 18 to buy the size of motors we fly. Another important thing to note, though, is um, so so we do high powered rocketry and that's where you need to be part of the AAA Association or someone and, and have the certifications. But they sell smaller rocket motors that you can go buy at a hobby store uh, and launch in a soccer field or something. You know, they'll go up 50 feet or something like that. So so if you want to start getting involved um, and do something more than just the bottle rocket uh, or the straw rocket, then obviously with your parents and in a very safe manner, uh, they sell smaller motors and small rockets that you can launch yourself. Um, yeah. And I think we have one other question from before um, talking about or asking about a favorite uh, time that something went wrong. Um, I guess for... For us, I, I haven't been part of our club when anything went wrong. I'm not sure about Mike or Francis. You guys have been here for a while. So <laughs> what's yeah, your favorite so, mishap that you can look back I on? I mean, part of uh, the question is kind of, you know, what do you learn from rocket failures? And kind of like what we talked about on the one slide with the rocket failures on it was that from this recovery failure, the reason this failed is because that bolt got ripped straight out of that bulkhead and the rocket just fell to the ground. And so from that, we learned, hey, maybe we shouldn't build this like that anymore. And now on our more recent rockets, instead of using I-bolts, we actually use U-bolts. And those are better because it has two connection points instead of just this one, so it's less likely to fail. And so I'm not sure I can really say I have a favorite time something went wrong because it's fun to watch them fail when it's not your rocket. <laughs> and so when it's your rocket, uh, it's hard to really say I have a favorite failure on that front. My favorite failure is when the rocket goes into a ditch and gets all wet and our, all of our electronics are ruined. That's my favorite. And by my favorite, I actually mean my least favorite. I hate it when that happens. And again, even though we launch in a basically empty cornfield, the rocket always finds a way into the ditch. <laughs> it's like a magnetic attraction. I swear there's something in that water that just calls yeah. the rockets with its siren song. Oh. 
Uh, I had another question about our our uh, name. Uh, so, uh, Francis, you want to take this one? Because I yeah. think you're the best at pronouncing this out of all of us. So, Taco Lycos is what we say. But uh, it is supposed to be pronounced Tahis Likus. And it's not supposed to be spelled like that. We've had that name forever. It means speedy wolf. Technically, Takis Likus means speedy wolf in Greek. We used to name our rockets a bunch of Greek names. Penumbra, no, that's not true. I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, Taco Lycos is a derivative of a bad translation. of. It, technically, it's supposed to be Grigoros Likos, but... Um, Tahis also works. Um, yeah, that's what taco lycos sort of means. Uh, Martha, do we have uh, any more questions from YouTube or? Uh, no, I didn't see any other questions uh, posted in my my document. So I think that we are finished up for this afternoon. So we are so glad that you all our participants could join us in our program today, and we're really thankful to all of you from NC State that you could also join us for astronomy days and and share more information about your club. It was really fun to learn about what you guys have been up to. And I know that we have lots of other programs all throughout this week. We have a trivia tonight at 6 p.m. just after this finishes up. And yes, Ira is reminding me that there are recordings of today's session and then other sessions all throughout the week that will be on the museum's YouTube channel. And then we also are going to be selling t-shirts and I believe those will be available as a link um, on the YouTube page as well in the recording. So um, thank you again for joining us. Thank you again to our sponsors, the North Carolina Space Grant and to Pepsi. And thank you to all of our NC State students and until we see you again, have a great rest of your evening and a great rest of your week. Bye, everybody.